Okay, everybody, there's still a few folks who are joining soon um, and some folks who are unable to make it, some for good reason. Um, there's a few folks who have restaurants that are uh, reopening today and they have to attend training sessions. So that's, uh, we're sad that they can't make it here, but uh, glad to hear that their restaurants are reopening. Um, we've got some technical difficulties to work through today. Uh, the half of the state of Colorado is currently without power. <laughs> uh, Colorado is where our colleague Greg Van Wagner is based. Um, Aspen has no power. It's 12 degrees in Aspen right now. <laughs> so uh, we're wishing them uh, warmth. But uh, Faye will... Um, we, we won't use the global diagram the way that we have in the past uh, because Greg is not able to, to be part of this. And so this um, discussion will be more of a panel discussion. Uh, we have uh, four amazing producers here today, Vittorio from Santa Margarita, Enrico from Dre Dona, uh, Alessandro from Medici Ermita, and Valentina from Marchese de Barolo. It sounds like some of uh, you folks uh, know these people, which is great. Uh, perhaps you've met in the past. Um, and we have, um, you know, a really interesting subject to discuss today. Uh, we're going to try to focus things as much as possible on wine and specifically Italian wine in those markets and, and how they are adjusting to the global pandemic. Um, we uh, understand, commiserate with all of you out there. Uh, we understand this is a very fraught topic. It's affected us all in many different ways. Some of you are out of work out there and maybe questioning what the future is for uh, the wine profession. And we're here to give you some information about Italy and the markets that it's serving and how those have changed uh, during the past uh, year, really, and what the future may hold. Um, so um, I think that uh, we will spend about 40 minutes uh, in discussion and then we'll break out and taste some wine. And the great note here is that uh, we'll end with wine in our glass, which is fantastic. Um, and at that point, the, the producers can discuss with you any the specifics of their given wines as we have in, the, in previous sessions. Um, but folks, due to um, a number of different things have uh, time constraints. So we will try to wrap this in an hour if possible. Um, and of course, if you want to hang out a little bit longer, uh, we, I certainly have a little bit more than an hour uh, if we want to discuss future things, but a few of the producers may have to jump off at the top of the hour. So um, with no further ado, uh, Vittorio, let's just start with you. Vittorio is from Santa Margarita. Um, tell us a little bit about what's going on there currently. We know that Europe is uh, uh, starting to go into a second wave um, and restaurants are, are shutting down in Italy. Um, what has Santa Margarita been able to do uh, to kind of counter the effects of the pandemic? Yeah, sure. Ciao, ciao James. Uh, well, thank you for having me here and uh, I represent the fourth generation of my family. Um, and I happen to be, I uh, just want to give you a heads up because you see my picture, the picture that the, the backdrop is uh, our family villa, but unfortunately I'm not in Italy now because I got stuck here in the US on the, on the East Coast where I have, you know, the US operation and since March I couldn't go back to Italy. So for the goods and for bads, but uh, uh, here I am. Uh, but I'm very close to, to my family and uh, our, you know, organization. And so we're trying to definitely uh, follow the, the path uh, together with the, with the rest of the producer uh, in Italy and also across the world because this pandemic is a, is a worldwide pandemic. So definitely affects the, the global uh, market, the global distribution and, and all the, the different uh, uh, steps that we, 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 we encounter every, every day. Um, so... I think it makes sense probably to give a little bit uh, an overview about uh, the past nine months uh, since we uh, we went through uh, three different quarters now. So Q1, let's say March, April, May, uh, Q2, uh, June, July, um, August, and and now September, October, and and of course November behind the the, the corner. 
So uh, uh, as you probably you can imagine, as even here in the uh, US, when uh, we got uh, the lockdown in, in Italy starting a couple of weeks, two, three weeks before here in the US, um, it was a, you know, a totally different world in just a few days um, with all the restrictions in place. Um, in Italy, we had a, a, even a stricter uh, rules and, and, and the restrictions than in the US when it comes to, um, you know, traveling, especially, you know, from one region to the others. And even uh, we couldn't walk uh, uh, out of the door for more than 250 meters from your your doorstep. So that was uh, really extreme for, you know, Italians in general, I think, because uh, we're not used to really follow at point, uh, you know, the, the regulations sometimes, but for the good. Um, and this was a very like out of the blue, you know, so people, they, they, they had to reinvent themselves at home. Um, of course, uh, when it comes to the consumption of uh, uh, food, wine, and other essential product products. Um, we had what we call here in US the, the pantry load uh, uh, mode in, uh, in the first week. So uh, a lot of um, buying uh, uh, in, in, the, in the grocery, uh, in the groceries and uh, uh, different outlets. Of course, the restaurants were, were shut down uh, already. Um, Try to, you know, Fill up the, the shelves in your in your uh, in your home and and uh, in your ca in your cabinet to to really you know think about the future because it was hard to 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 understand what's going on. So um, so what, what what is the the point maybe here was that you know the the first three months uh, we we suffer uh, a lot uh, uh, in, in terms of uh, even uh, the performance of the of the, the business and, and you know, in, in the domestic market and, uh, and of course abroad following, uh, you know, abroad the same situation that we lived in, in we were living in Italy. Um, on the other side, uh, you know, the, the, the grocery shopping has said uh, has, you know, has been uh, um, pushed because, uh, you know, it, it was an opportunity for, as I said, for the consumers to, to load up, to load the, the, their, its pantry, its, uh, its pantry in the, in the closet. So um, that was, you know, for the brands, I think uh, for the brands that are a little bit more um, mainstream or they have a better distribution in terms of uh, uh, outlets, uh, that was a, a, a positive thing, if you want, in this uh, crazy environment. Um, so, you know, the brand per se, Santa Margherita, as you know, my family also, uh, produces uh, the other brands and we have different uh, estates and properties ac across the country so we can definitely uh, see and, and we experience uh, both uh, uh, trend so uh, a brand like Santa Margherita with the with the you know the strength of the of the brand itself for the consumer mindset and also I always refer to the 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 the, 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 the uh, concept of the uh, comfort brand, uh, the comfort food, the comfort uh, wine that uh, we all, uh, you know, having somehow in our in our experience. So uh, we 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 got to see that kind of uh, uh, trend to really uh, have a quick, uh, instant buying uh, uh, at the at the sidewalk, uh, maybe for for pickup or or deliveries, you know, right uh, at the at the step door, and and that was definitely to in favor of these uh, more uh, heritage brands or brands that have been around for a long time, they they have gave the the, the you know the uh, consumers um, um, comfort to really buy without even having uh, uh, too many questions, too many options, uh, you know, in front of them because that's another uh, important. Yeah, I, that, I think we're seeing that trend uh, in the U.S. quite a bit, especially um, early on when people were doing a lot of grocery shopping. It was like, oh, I know that brand and I know that, you know, I don't have time to mess around and uh, search for something more specific and uh, I want to get in and out. And uh, to your point, uh, Vittorio, I think uh, that happened uh, to a large degree in the U.S. So, uh, Sandro, um, I'd love to hear from you. Uh, Sandro makes delicious Lambrusco, and this is a, a market segment that 
you know, has done quite well with restaurants as uh, we sommeliers have really gotten behind the deliciousness of Lambrusco in the past five or 10 years. So I'm curious to hear how um, your uh, Lambrusco in general, and then the Medici Hermite specifically, um, how has your experience been? Um, you, the, Lambrusco, I think probably not the first thing that folks, uh, general consumers are gonna reach for in a grocery store shelf, but maybe I'm wrong. Thank you for the delicious, James. Hello, ciao. Um, so first of all, I just introduced myself. I represent the fifth generation of the Medici family. Uh, we are an historical winery located in the Emilia-Romagna region. So we produce uh, Lambrusco. Uh, that is the local wine uh, in the Emilia side. Uh, actually, uh, our winery export uh, uh, the 70% of the production and we export in over uh, 70 countries in the world. So actually we have uh, like a global vision and a global uh, strategy. Uh, uh, we can tell also that we try to have uh, like uh, a commercial and marketing omni-channel strategy. And I think that has been very, very important, especially in this difficult period. So we try to sell in on trade. And as you perfectly know, on trade uh, suffered a lot. Uh, in the last uh, six, seven months. Uh, we sell in the off trade and actually it's 50-50. And then we sell in online. And uh, in the last two years, we started to sell also for a very small percentage of our annual turnover directly to consumers. We have two wine shops in uh, the city of Reggio Emilia. That is our uh, hometown. And uh, one year ago, we started also uh, within private e-commerce just uh, for the Italian market that for sure we, we developed in the last five years due to the COVID uh, situation, as you can uh, understand. So um, for Lambrusco, first of all, I talk about Lambrusco in general, then uh, I, I, will, I will do a focus on our reality. Uh, for Lambrusco in general, we have two uh, souls. We have uh, like the new soul of Lambrusco, that is the, the, um, the kind of Lambrusco, the DOC Lambrusco that usually producers, the quality pro the Lambrusco that usually producers try to sell just uh, in restaurants, in wine bars. And uh, this kind of soul of Lambrusco is the, is the part of Lambrusco that is trying to, to recreate the image of Lambrusco, try to increase the image of Lambrusco. And producers started to do this kind of Lambrusco like 15, 20 years ago. And that uh, part of Lambrusco, the DOC Lambrusco suffered a lot for sure in the last, uh, in the last five, six uh, months, because uh, as I said previously, uh, on trade market is suffering a lot, is still suffering a lot. The other soul of Lambrusco is the IGT Lambrusco. And uh, you can go in every Walmart, uh, in uh, every single, uh, uh, supermarket in, uh, in your country and you can find easily five, six, seven uh, Lambrusco IGT. There is a huge difference in terms of price and that kind of Lambrusco didn't suffer. Um, that kind of Lambrusco increased the sales like 35%. So we have two different, um, as I said, souls in the Lambrusco area. Uh, now I, I talk about our winery. Um, our winery, um, Thanks God, uh, and this is like a miracle. A miracle uh, in the la in this year, talking about sales, our sales are more or less the same of last year. That's why I said it is like a miracle. It's like minus three percent. Um, that's because um, for sure we sold uh, like thirty-five percent less premium wines because, as I said. Uh, uh, this category is suffering a lot, but in the same time, we increased uh, the sales of uh, our entry level products. Uh, and we had a market, Mexico, that is one of our main markets together with Japan, US, and Germany, uh, where last year we got two new uh, customers. Um, Mexico is a really pri price sensitive market. Uh, and uh, thanks to these two big customers, thanks to these two big partners, uh, this year we developed the sales of the entry levels product. So in general, we really, really, really can't complain. 
I would also talk about um, uh, other two topics. The first one is online. Uh, online is booming. Online had a, a big, big, big increase in the last period. Um, as I said previously, our winery tried to have uh, um, like a, um, a commercial omni-channel strategy. So online is a, is a channel that we are discovering and that we are uh, um, that we are trying to work with. Um, and we work with several e-commerce platforms around the world. And also we have uh, and we develop our private um, uh, e-commerce platform. And we are seeing uh, very important results. Uh, we are sure that uh, online will become more and more an important segment. Um, but in the same time, we don't have to forget uh, about uh, the big segment. Uh, our historical partners, uh, restaurants on trade, off trade. So um, I think it's very important for the future uh, focus on the old channel that we have. Uh, I don't know uh, how online uh, will increase in the last years, but I read recently a date that I think is very, very important and wine industry really need to work uh, on this date because uh, uh, I just read this uh, information that in uh, 2025, the 100% of the, of the sales, both offline and online, will be influenced by digital. And I think that uh, uh, regarding this topic, wine industries have to increase a lot. Uh, I just conclude this, uh, this part uh, uh, telling that uh, I think we have, <clears throat> we have two challenges for uh, the next years. The first one is for sure um, online and uh, digital, uh, because as I said, I think we really, really, really have to increase in this because digital is important today, but in the next years will become crucial. And the second point is sustainability that I think is the topic of every companies uh, that discussed this year that will become the key and the, and the password for the future. I love it. That's great. Um, I just want to interject here that, you know, as people are discovering new ways of bringing their wines to market, whether it be digital or, or traditional uh, avenues, um, I, I'm seeing some really creative stuff out there. So I have a friend here in Seattle who owns a wine shop. And in the heart of things being shut down in, in March, in April and May, um, she transitioned from you know, the normal way of shop, people coming into her shop and shopping for wine to, uh, you know, this, uh, this desk that she set up in the door, set up in the doorway. So people come to the desk and she says, what do you want? And they say, I want Chardonnay. And she says, okay, you want, you know, something rich and buttery. And so anyway, she serves as kind of like a personal sommelier to these people. And actually her interaction with her clientele has uh, grown uh, tighter because they can't just walk in and you know walk the shelves now they've got to go through her and it's really created this unique connection between her and her clientele and um you know digitally too i've seen people do some really smart stuff i'm excited in the breakout session to hear from folks uh stories like this about what's happening in your uh particular markets and some smart ideas that people have i know Restaurants are doing wine clubs, for instance. Um, there's online pairings. Uh, you know, I've dreamed for years uh, through Sound Foundation of doing a, a, an enrichment trip that's partnered with the Nebbiolo producer and, and the Alba Truffle Festival. Um, and someday we'll do that. Uh, but we're, you know, locally here, we're, we're going to try to do that, uh, not through Sound Foundation, but through my business. Uh, to do that with a, a chef and a producer um, and we might be able to get it done because it's digital rather than the logistics of giving, getting everybody to Barolo. So um, speaking of Barolo, um, we, uh, we have um, Valentina here. Uh, Valentina, tell us a little bit. So we've heard from Alessandro and Vittorio about how the market drivers for them being maybe the other comfort brands or the l less expensive wines. I'm curious to hear how um, Barolo as a DOCG and as a label uh, is, is dealing with this. Are you selling more Barbera, more Dolcetto or Bar is Barolo still strong? Where, where are things at? 
Well, that was the, the fear at the beginning, because of course, as soon as uh, Italy was uh, completely locked down, uh, we saw um, uh, the on, especially online uh, sector registered a um, flexion of something like minus 70% in Barolo sales. So we were very worried that this was going to be the trend for all of the period of time from then to, to now. But actually after a little while, we started to um, see an inversion uh, in this trend. In fact, today we are seeing as Barolo denomination, Barolo DOCG, actually an increase in the sales of uh, 5%. So not really much compared to last year, but definitely much compared to what was the, um, what was the data at the beginning uh, of the lockdown. So the, uh, what we are experiencing here in Piemont is that people maybe um, are purchasing a little bit uh, less wines, but they're opting for uh, the high-end ones. So uh, we are a little bit worried for the other denominations. Of course, uh, the whites, uh, Dolcetto is suffering a lot. Barbera, which used to be our everyday wine, the comfort wine that we all had on our tables, uh, now so a little bit of a um, um, uh, negative trend compared to Barolo. So it's uh, quite uh, um, peculiar, the situation here. And speaking to restaurants and to our clients, which now had started uh, to work again uh, until yesterday, uh, we are seeing this also in the average purchases at the restaurant. They have, of course, less people coming in because there are less uh, um, uh, seated places that they can, uh, they can set in the restaurant, but the average expense of each, um, of each person is higher compared to last year. So I feel like people that come in Piemonte may be driven by uh, truffle in this time of the year, but also um, other, um, other attractions uh, in the summer months. Uh, came here to allow yourself maybe some uh, uh, cuddles that they were not able to allow themselves before. Sorry, before. That, that's uh, fascinating. So I think in this market in Seattle, I'll just speak to that, um, we are seeing both of these trends, people going for the comfort, but then also going to the top tier. Um, and some of that middle tier stuff seems to be suffering more so than either the top or the lower. Um, Greg Van Wagner, are you out there? Are you able to uh, comment on what's happening? Uh, Greg is, as you, pro uh, you probably know, is based in Aspen. Aspen is a specific, very specific market, obviously, because it's driven by um, skiing and outdoor uh, stuff. And actually, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, um, has actually seen, an, uh, uh, you know, is, is not as disastrous as we might have thought in terms of the tourism there, because people rather than traveling internationally uh, are traveling uh, in, in, within the States. And um, Greg, if you can just comment on what the restaurant scene is like, if you are able to connect again, I know that you um, might not be able to. No, he's not here, James, I'm afraid. He's not been able okay. to connect. Um, oh. Well, <laughs> perhaps we can uh, d discuss, you know, how different, oh wait, is he there? Yep. Sorry, sorry, if we uh, start out, oh geez. <laughs> Who's that? Well, um, if Greg, we can you're... add something in the meanwhile, we are experiencing exactly the same trend. People are uh, rediscovering what is uh, locally closer to them. So we are having a lot of, of course, Italian tourism and uh, in the summer months, also people from Germany, Switzerland, France that were, but even uh, um, the, the Netherlands or Belgium, they were all driving down to, to Piemont and perhaps they were stopping here. They were not going down south as they used to do in the summer months. So we did see an increase in, uh, in tourism as well. We were missing, of course, all of the overseas, but big um, um, national and uh, close by tourism too. So I would say that until now, the situation was not too bad, even comparing our numbers to the trend of the, of the region. So far, I think that we are quite in line. 
Um, just uh, as uh, Alessandro said, we are in a similar situation because we export in 70 different countries, but our market is split almost in half between Italy and uh, the export. So in both places, at the end, I mean, we are, of course, seeing a, a, a minus in front of our numbers compared to last year and now, but I would say that the um, the balance is pretty much the same. So we lost a little bit in Italy, as surprises, of course, the um, the countries in which there is a monopolies like Canada or Scandinavia are doing pretty well, while the others are catching not catching up right now. So even in United States, our numbers are, are quite solid at the moment. There's no doubt that people are drinking uh, more than, than they have in the past, uh, wherever they are. Uh, Enrico, I'm going to direct this question at you, and but it's open to uh, all four of you, and I'd love to hear from each of you on this, because um, I haven't heard there being any difficulties with this, but I had anticipated that harvest might be quite difficult, uh, given that uh, harvest crews are not are often come from different countries and travel is, is really limited right now. Did you have any troubles with getting harvest crews together? Well, uh, from my point of view, of course, my Dreidona winery, our winery is it's a family boutique winery. To give you an idea, we have a, our average production is 10,000 cases a year, so 120,000 bottles. So we are very uh, small, very small, <laughs> absolutely small. We almost uh, split our sales half half in Italy and half uh, around the world with selected importer distributors. Uh, on the technical side, we work, uh, of course, because it's not a big winery, we have an historical group of people that, that works uh, with us for many, many years. And our big effort when the, the, the COVID uh, uh, lockdown came is try to keep all our employees and people who work with us uh, uh, in the best condition as possible, try to save all the, the, the working place they have. That was uh, my, especially my family, first point of view. We are affected from the COVID quite a lot. Just to give you an idea, uh, on March 12th, we was up 25% in sales. And the problem, the main problem I had is probably I would go out of stock with all the wines before uh, the release of the next vintages <laughs> today. I, love I want to give you uh, a hope also if you are in the middle of a storm, you know, because the, as, as my background of a sailor, you know, a storm it pass and will pass. The problem is if you are able to pass through the storm. And so to set up all the, the things that could help you to pass through the storm in the safest way as possible. So our way, we produce red wines, Sangiovese and Cabernet Sauvignon that are very long uh, lasting in the bottle, so we will probably put some more uh, bottle aging of all our wines and we for sure we will be able to pass through the situation. But from our point, uh, uh, our market is uh, on premise, full on premise. So restaurants, wine bar, specialized uh, wine shops. And it was the part of the market was hit that is the most all around the world because all our uh, distributors have the same problems. So lockdown in the restaurants, people are afraid to go, that, to go out. <clears throat> and of course, we maintain, luckily, all the, 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 the private customers used to buy from us. And the sales in the wine shop was run from the, the owner of the wine shop and the sommelier that run the wine shop in a very smart way because they see many, many people, very professional, try to reinvent the way to be a sommelier. So be a sommelier in, uh, in a restaurant. So you have the, 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 the physical touch with the people. You can suggest some. Thing. You can introduce something and you can also have an immediate feedback if you let people taste a sip of wines. If you like it or not, I can change it. That you cannot have it through internet because I can suggest you a bottle of wine and people buy a bottle of wine. If you drink it by alone at home, if you don't like it, you have double damage. You don't like the wine, but you don't, didn't like also the suggestion you, you had and you didn't have a chance to speak directly. I, I miss a lot the human part of this work. The most beautiful part of this work is uh, the human contact and the, the friendship that I set up all over the world in more than 25 years that I ran around with my two bottles of wines around the world. And, this was, and I, it's, it's something that I think have to come back 
in the same way that the digital part will take uh, a place that we cannot forget in the future. So, and the, 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 the big trick will be probably be able to put together a human side and digital opportunities to, to run the market. Talking okay. about the harvest, the harvest was, uh, for us, was not so complicated to do. So we technically we have a very nice harvest and we was at least lucky in the weather side. So we didn't have any uh, too much water or less water kind of stuff. And uh, we are pretty happy. I know this in some part of Italy, we had some problem to find uh, workers, but I don't think it was really, really the, the main problem at the moment, because uh, again, I don't know exactly how it works because I think we will be in this middle of this storm at least till next June 2021, at least. And after that, we just have to work, try to recover a little bit the, the damage we had at our little sailing boat in the middle of this ocean of craziness. <laughs> you, you bring up a, a great point, and that is um, bringing the human context to, to wine. And I've had the opportunity to visit all of you um, in Italy, and I can tell you uh, that it's just nearly impossible to bring the charm that you all, you are charming of course in and of yourselves, but the charm of your um, of your wineries and the cooking and I'm, you know, I'm hungry right now because I'm thinking about all the great food that I've had at the, to your places. But um, to your point, Enrico, I think that is something that we are just going to have to adapt to. And the way that we sell wine digitally is going to have to be more contextualized. You, you, can't just be a bottle of shot on on a website. That's not going to do it. Um, and then you know, people. I see. Uh, I'm trying to follow the comments here. Ashley was mentioning that she has um, she's doing some cool stuff with uh, local chefs and home catering and, and dinners in, in people's homes. And um, that's I think you know uh, one way of sommeliers kind of spinning this and, and keeping the context alive because we do need to have that person, that personal presence uh, involved in, in, in wine. It really separates it from you know, most other beverages. Um, just curious, Vittorio, did you uh, have any issues or anybody else, uh, Valentino or Enrico, did you have any issues with, uh, with Harvest? Not really, not that much. Uh, also because you know, in Europe during the summertime, you could travel again so they they lift uh, lifted the the restriction so uh, whoever you know whatever was the the need the the labor needed uh, you know you could uh, pretty you know have it anyway so um no i mean uh, i align with the you know the the rest of the of the of the panel in terms of uh, experiences and and um, strategies that we put it in place uh, just to conclude my my part uh, as Alessandro and Valentina and uh, Enrico were saying. So I think we, we were all on the same boat. And now we have to just think about the future, uh, be positive and proactive. Um, as uh, as uh, Enrico said, you know, selling a bottle of wine at the restaurant is different than, uh, you know, on online, of course. I would I, I would see some opportunities to get out of this crisis for our people, our fellows in on the floor even looking opportunities at the you know in the right uh, specialty shops today they will probably become like it's sort of a, a channel uh, to still selling those uh, niche wine that need a, they have a pedigree that they need special care and so why not so just re reinvent themselves on a different role uh, but same talking about the same things that could be uh, an opportunity uh, from my opinion at least I appreciate that. I think, um, you know, one thing that's in the back of all of our minds, uh, it would take a whole nother hour plus or maybe a week to discuss is the future of the sommelier and the future of restaurants. And I firmly believe that sommeliers will uh, still be around uh, as we go through this thing. Their, our roles may change, right? We might do it in a different fashion. Um, but I think that again, that human connection is what people what gets people excited about wine, and it might might happen digitally. Um, hopefully, it will uh, in restaurants too. I think you know those that can make it through. Um, I, I think 
are going to do just fine because people want to be around other people. And if we can't do it for a certain period of time, you know, uh, I think most of us can endure that. But at some point, um, we're, we're going to be back together and hopefully we'll be able to celebrate together. Uh, and then so the, the idea that restaurants and sommeliers are, are dying breed, I think, um, is short-sighted in my mind. Um, again, we could talk for hours about that, but Valentina, can you tell us, uh, it, it, it was harvest different for you this year? Well, it wasn't really different. As uh, Victoria said, during summer was so quite uh, easy to, to travel. So even workers who don't live here all of the time were able to come. It's more difficult now. So right now we are seeing a lack of uh, people that used to work uh, in the uh, weeks and then the months after the harvest. So now we are seeing the real difficulties. Uh, but the harvest went well. This year has been uh, splendid. We had even a lot of quantities, so great quality and a lot of quantity. Uh, so, uh, of course, there was some, uh, some nice hopes for, for the future. And I think that this moment where we were all separated and uh, we were so close together, thanks to the virtual meetings and the dinners, I was reading now, um, um, Jen, who was uh, reminding me of the beautiful event that we did together, helped us to understand how we can use these tools. But as Enrico said, we have to implement this with real life because what I'm personally experiencing um, is an inversion of trend even here. At the beginning, we were all so excited about this virtual gathering and now we can't go back to meeting in person. So I think that here can rise even more opportunities of understanding how to use these tools in the right way how to communicate um, in, a, in a clear way, maybe even more professionally as we did before with tools which we didn't know how to use so well. So of course, this was the moment where we could all um, study and uh, rethink our, uh, about our communication and marketing strategies and being more professional from now on. And Alessandro, how about you? Uh, regarding the harvest, we had uh, the harvest went very well. Uh, in terms of quantity, we had 30% uh, more than last uh, three years. Uh, we came from three very, very bad uh, harvests in terms of quantity. And also for quality, we, we had very good uh, characteristic, organolytic characteristic. The seed is great. And regarding the point that uh, Vittorio, Enrico and Valentina discussed before, I totally agreed. And uh, uh, I'm also glad that uh, Elise is here because it, she is one of the last people that I saw in person in March in my last trip, in my last tour. So it's beautiful to see and to remember like the last people that I saw and I touched in person. Because at the time we could touch the people. So Exactly, right. And you could also serve them delicious lasagna. So we're going to have to figure out a way to, to digitally uh, tra transmit your, your grandmother's lasagna to everybody out here because it's a really an insane experience. And Valentina is, uh, you can see her background. There's a, a cask of that background. Um, we should definitely touch on that cask uh, in the breakout group. Um, but if you're not in that breakout group, it's a very old cask and um, there's a story behind it. But maybe the important thing to remember about that is that, you know, wine endures um, and we've seen hard times before. And yet, uh, these ancient casks are still around and, and we're still making wine and still drinking it and still selling it. So um, this is we, exactly we, the lesson that I think we are all learning. As uh, Enrico well said, we are in, a, in the middle of a storm. We just have to understand how to survive from this and how to address uh, the new situation which will come after this. Uh, speaking with, of course, in these days, uh, in these months, we had the opportunity of being closer to our families to make more um, discussions also internally and understand how we feel about all of this. And speaking with my dad, which I was able to spend more time with since the uh, compared to the past years where I was always gone and uh, traveling all over, I really understood that these are moments of, of transitions and just as uh, Alessandro and Vittorio um, and uh, Enrico in his future, 
uh, we see we saw a lot of different situations in our history, yet we are still here, just as these cats that you mentioned that have 200 years and they still perfectly accomplish their job, which is aging wine. So I'm sure that there will be a future for all of us. And just as we got out of every situation, we will be out of this one too, especially if we all together continuously uh, discussing and uh, understanding how to do better in the future as we are doing now. That's great. I'm glad you brought up your father. Um, when we visited you, Valentina, I don't know if you'll recall this, but we were dining in your restaurant and having a lovely meal and your father walked in and you hadn't seen him in uh, weeks or months or however long the period of time was. And there was just this embrace that was so lovely. Uh, those of us on that trip will never forget that moment. Um, so thank you for those reminders of uh, endurance and family and the, the bright things that we can um, take to heart through all of this. Greg Van Wagner, if you are available, I see you there. Uh, let's see if we can hear you. Yes. If you can talk <laughs> a little bit about uh, Aspen and uh, what that, that market is uh, like right now. Um, well, so hi, everybody. Uh, my name's Greg. I, I built the, uh, the virtual tour, but first and foremost, I'm a, I'm a sommelier. I'm the wine director at uh, Jimmy's here in uh, Aspen, Colorado. Um, and yeah, we shut down in the middle of uh, ski season in March. And it was, um, you know, like many, just an absolute, like who knows which way is up. And uh, at one point we were driving a bicycle around town selling to-go cocktails and, um, you know, no real clear view of the future. Um, but we, we've been very fortunate here this summer that, you know, at least people, uh, you know, have been out, they've wanted to go out and, you know, it really, it really kind of harkened back to, you know, that, that common point that, you know, COVID kind of cut right into the core of human nature, which is really for people to commune and people to get together and to be out and to socialize and to feel that connection. And, you know, that's millennium of evolution. You know, it's, it's so difficult to pull back on that need to be in person and, and that need to commune and to talk with the sommelier, to be out at a restaurant um, and to just be out in public and, and talking with people that, you know, we've, we've been fortunate that it's, it's encouraging to see people, you know, kind of come back to that and come back to that, that core of human nature. Um, but also it's, it's, it's been an interesting situation where, you know, at least as our, our restaurant, you know, faced with, okay, how do you, how do you make it work for the foreseeable future or also potentially for, for a long time going from there? And it really brought us back to this point of, you know, all of a sudden considerations and questions that we had had before that were off the table are all of a sudden no longer off the table. So we, we really began looking at every piece of our operation and say, okay, all of our last 24 years as a restaurant, we did things with one general philosophy you know, is that the philosophy that will continue in the future? And at, at least for us, you know, the, the overriding philosophy was to say, okay, well, you know, you, you always scrap for the last dollar. You, you scrap for this, you, you stay open longer, you stay open later, you, you go further into the off season. And we've, we're, we're only busy about seven months a year out here, but um, we, that was always our philosophy. We were the latest restaurant to close. We would always kind of scrap for the, the last thing. And it, it shifted to, okay, the last dollar is no longer there. So how do we run the leanest operation where, you know, we, we went down to five days a week. That, would, that was unheard of a year ago. And you find random things. Our, our consistency is up because the same crew works together uh, every day, our executive chef works with every um, chef in the kitchen every day of the week. And so it's, it's still a major learning process and who knows how it's going to end up. I'll, I'll, I'll let you know in maybe a year or sooner than that, but um, it, it's more just every question and everything is on the table. So we're, we're willing to explore every option and see how we can weather this and um, 
you know? That's great. I think, uh, I think one of the things that um, it would be great if there could be some kind of billboard that goes up across the United States saying to the general consumer, restaurants are better than they ever have been because you've got, you know, GMs waiting tables and you've got the actual chef in the kitchen cooking, you know, and maybe working a few stations. And um, to your point, like the, the, the really the core staff is, is tighter in, in some of these operations. So you can have a great experience, even though it's, everything's bizarre and weird. Um, okay. So it is almost 50 after the hour. Uh, I think we should jump in breakout groups. A couple of things I want to know before we do that. First thing, um, Lynn will kill me if uh, I don't mention that there is a survey that we would love for all of you to fill out. This is really important. We realize that surveys are kind of a pain in the butt. It's only 10 or 15 questions. It'll take you five minutes max, but it's really important for um, everybody to get this feedback from you. We always are looking to improve that this has been an enjoyable experience over the past four weeks. I've had a lot of fun. I feel like I know some of you, which is kind of incredible um, given the difficulties of this time and this medium that we're using. Um, and gosh, I can't wait to, to get back and, and be in Italy and hopefully with some of you folks um, in, in the future. Uh, so thank you for your patience through all of this. Um, and uh, what else do I wanna say? Let's taste some wine, yeah? Shall we?